Hello and welcome to Office of Harbour. It is February and this year I've made the very poor choice of deciding to do a book a day again. And, well, this year is going to be quite different from last year. Last year was the first time I tried this and I did get 28 books read in 28 days of February. This year is a leap year and I have way more personal projects and the books that I have in my stack or pile are a little bit longer. So, I don't really know why I'm doing this. I am already a bit unhinged. It is the 7th day of February and all of my time is gone, so I do have a good reason for doing that. The good reason is... Book number one, What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky by Leslie uh, Neka Arima. I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm so sorry. Uh, this is a book of short stories by a Nigerian author who is writing about uh, kind of like a magic realist lens of issues of modern Africa and uh, migration to America and how culture and all of these things play out looking at this whole idea of globalization in a globalized world with very human characters. I thought that it's, it's an incredibly clever book because because it has magic real stories, you never really know if you're getting a story that is realistic or a story that is fantastical. You get surprised by the surrealism every single time. And sometimes the metaphors and the, the symbols just work so, so well. Uh, my favorite story is actually the title story, which is set in the near future. It is about people who are able to take in the emotions of others, and that's a much wider metaphor for... I interpret it as interventionist follower and policy, this idea of human beings who are from more well-off backgrounds or circumstances deliberately reaching out and taking on the suffering of other people and what it takes to do that and whether that's a good or a bad thing. I thought that was quite a nuanced discussion of a story and the rest of this book is pretty good too. I would give it a 4 out of 5. Book number 2, The Optimist's Daughter. So this is by Eudora Welty, a very respected American writer. To me, I've always seen her as something of like a writer's writer because she is someone who is respected for her style and her technique, not so much for her exciting plots or narratives that really carry well or sell well. Instead, she's a name that is very respected, and so The Optimist's Daughter is one of her best-known works. It won the Pulitzer Prize in insert year here, um, and it's a really, really simple story. So it is set in, I want to say, Mississippi. Uh, and it is about a large family that is from kind of a regional rural area that has, or well, the family name has cultural capital in the city. And the the patriarch, who's a judge, passes away, but when his funeral is hosted, his family is kind of split between his very conservative and well, like closely knit inner family and his second wife, who is from a very different background and really does not gel well with everybody else. And so it has elements of pathos, it has elements of culture shock even. It really expresses well the kinds of conflicts that occur in these insular middle American and southern American communities where people create bonds based on association and family and history and that makes it so much more difficult for them to connect to anybody who doesn't really fit their attitude towards life or society. Um, everything I read about this book actually seems to have a different interpretation to what I have. So the main premise of the novel is that the the patriarch of the family, Judge McKelva, uh, his first wife passes away and so he remarries a woman who is younger than his current daughter. The no novel's narrated from the perspective of his daughter. He marries a woman younger than the daughter named Faye. And Faye is kind of positioned to look like some kind of social climber, like marrying him for his money, but she's genuinely very affected by his death and she is treated just terribly by the rest of his larger family. And I felt quite a bit of sympathy for Faye, even though, from all the analysis I've read, it seems to think that this novel is about the narrator, the judge's daughter, who learns to not trust people like Faye. There's no real redemption or anywhere in the story. But to me, I think it's much more complicated than that. I think that everybody in the story is given a unique perspective on humanity, and it is heavily weighed towards the insular community where everyone kind of thinks the same way and encourages the same sense of thought 
and we have Faye who just absolutely stands out and has a terrible time of things and then reacts in a very extreme way from that. I thought it was a very clever book, very intelligent book. Definitely something I would recommend if you're interested in re reading or writing literary fiction because the technique here is really fantastic. Um, it takes what could otherwise be an either very melodramatic or somewhat boring family situation and draws out emotional complexity from that, so I would give it a 4 out of 5. Third book, Brett Eason Ellis' Less Than Zero. This is a very hypnotic novel, so it is about a young man named Clay. He's 18, he goes back to LA to hang out with his friends, enjoy his life, uh, and leaves his place of study, which is in New Hampshire. Uh, his experience of LA is this post-apocalyptic, hellscape, drug-laden disaster of a place, right? It is completely devoid of emotional effect. It is just something that washes over him and the reader. Its characters just having completely meaningless sex with everybody else. It is a shallow desire for significance and fame and the attainment of none of that. It is just all full of drugs and sex and rock and roll and dissatisfaction the entire way through. And after a while, the, the narrator and the reader, they just get numb to it. It just starts to mean nothing to anybody. You start to lose any sense of emotional connection with these characters. And then the violence happens. Then it just becomes absolutely wild, crazy things happen. To the extent where I'm not really sure how much is meant to feel real and how much is meant to be surreal or imagined or dreamlike. I don't really know. Uh, that not knowing, I think, is very core to the experience of the novel as well. It is by the author of American Psycho, so a much more famous novel and film, and that sense of you don't really know exactly what's happening, but what is being projected towards you is often quite dramatic and extreme. And all of that is centered around this 18-year-old named Clay who doesn't really know where he's going in the world, but also doesn't really know what meaning is at all, and it reflects that late 80s postmodernism and just is a searing and abrasive read the entire way through. Uh, I think it worked. I think I understood very clearly what the novel was going for, and I felt it very deeply inside myself as well, even as though I kind of didn't like my experience. I can remember it very clearly. It's, it's poignant, so I would give it a 4 out of 5 as well. It's been going well so far. Book number 4 is The Prime of Miss Jean Brody by Muriel Spark. I didn't really know I was what to expect from going to this. It is about a private boarding school where one of the teachers, named Jean Brody, uh, has a very particular way of looking at the world. She is individualistic, she is excited, and creates this little clique of students to surround her, kind of plucks them out of the school, and tells each of them that they are special, they are unique, they are set apart from everybody else, and for better or for worse, this has effects on each of these little girls' lives. Um, this book is set in the 1920s and 30s, and then into the 1940s, where the development of fascism across... Uh, it's set in Scotland, by the way, but the development of fascism in Italy and Germany becomes part of the novel's plot point. It's very interesting to me that this book explores, almost in the background, the allure of something like fascism, how the myth of exceptionality and being set apart and being better than everybody else, that maps really neatly onto fascism and the way that... I guess we distrust fascism today after World War II because of what happened and because we learn from the lessons of history. Whereas to set a book before that time period... Now this was written I believe in the 1950s and 1960s, but to set a book before we really understood what that was and to show characters that view individuals like Mussolini and Hitler in very positive lights and just to kind of leave that the way it is, the way it is and to show the benefits and drawbacks that this approach has on students is interesting. It is interesting. It doesn't really give a definitive judgment or answer on anything it does. Instead, it just shows kind of the more banal side of things. It lowers the stakes quite significantly, so it is not about war, it is not about uh, violent conflict. It's more just interpersonal relationships, friendships, relationships, how a fascist worldview can affect that. that. So I think I really need to slow down and think about this a bit more, because to me it was a very mild book. It wasn't really something that a lot of stuff happened or made me think very deeply. Maybe it was also after reading Less Than Zero, which is a maximalist book, 
and coming to this, which is a lot more muted, I didn't quite gel with it as much as probably I should have. So I would give it a 3 out of 5, and maybe one day revisit it and think more deeply about what it's trying to say. Book number 5... Yeah, book number 5. The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, the second book in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. It is a comedy sci-fi text. This one is set immediately after the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where our narrator, or our protagonist, Arthur Dent's uh, planet, which is Earth, gets blown up to make a highway overpass, and he travels the universe alongside a bunch of other kooky characters to try to figure things out. Uh, the premise of this book is that they go to a restaurant, the restaurant at the end of the universe, and they just want to eat some food, but this, the premise of this restaurant is that it is at the end of the universe, like the literal, not the geographical end, but the time end of the universe. They jump forward through time and watch the destruction of the universe, and from then, from there, things get weird and wacky, there's more questions about what is the meaning of life, or what is the nature of humanity, and stuff happens. Uh, stuff sure does happen. It is very much a book about stuff that happens, and the humor that you can create about stuff happening. We don't know much about the characters, and we don't care too much about them. There is this really wry British humor that runs its way throughout, and some really, really funny one-liners. I did smile or chuckle here and there, just because the way that it's phrased is, is really, really funny. Uh, but the actual plot, like the sequence of events from A to B to C to D that this book takes, um, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's hard to get a large sense of emotional response from the sequence of events in this book, and this is the second book in the series. I'm sure it goes to further places. Uh, I love the ideas, I love the characters, I love the moment-to-moment -moment writing. I just wish that the narrative was just a bit more cohesive as well. I know it wasn't initially written as a novel, it was written as a radio play, uh, but still, the things that I want out of this, uh, I think, are not here, and also are here less so than in the original novel, which to me had a bit more of driving force. Here it's a bit more like, no one really knows what's happening, no one knows where they're going or what they're doing, and that takes a lot of the tension out of the actual narrative, so it's just a bunch of space jokes. 3 out of 5. Book number six is Playing Beady Bow. This is an Australian novel. Uh, it is by Ruth Park, writing in the 1980s about a young girl who is sent back in time into the 1870s uh, in a time where Australia was still a Victorian colony and, well, Sydney was under the control of a very Victorian government and the good and bad things that arise from that. Now, it is in many ways kind of like a kooky time travel caper. It has moments of drama, moments of romance. Uh, it seems to want to mythologize that particular period of Australian history, which I think is not so much worth mythologizing. I think that, well actually is that really true? Because it definitely does show the sordid angle to the 1800s. It shows how dangerous it is, it shows how unfit and unfair it is for most human beings, it shows that sense of inequality, and it has our modern narrator going, well the 1980s narrator, going into that historical period, trying to acclimate to it, and having just a really hard time because people there just see the world so differently, they see questions of social class and family very differently, and it's hard for them to make connections, but then it kind of just turns into a more straightforward adventure and romance plot. I didn't think it was that special. In fact, if I was forced to study this in high school, I know this is a very commonly taught text in Australia, if I was forced to study this in high school, I would genuinely dislike it a lot more than I already have. Reading it now, it's more of a historical curiosity because it does speak to a time where Australia seems to, I guess, value its European history a bit more, Whereas nowadays, this is just not really a kind of story that would interest me in any sense, so I would give it a 3 out of 5. Okay, and last one for this set, so this is the first seven books of February, and I might just do week and week and week. Uh, this is Summer Crossing by Truman Capote. I'm slowly working through his full set of literary works. This is his very first novel, and it's a novel that he didn't actually want to publish, because it was published posthumously once the full manuscript was found. And... It's hard to evaluate, and this is one of the reasons why I don't like reading Juvenalia, because it creates this myth of the author that everything they write is gold and perfect and worth preserving if they happened to have more famous and more successful works later down in their life. So I loved In, Q in Cold Blood, I loved Reckless Symphonies. Summer Crossing is nowhere near as good as either of those books. It is in some ways a lot more mean-spirited, so we follow 
uh, Grady, who is a young woman. She's a a sister of Apple, who their family is kind of like a New York socialite kind of vibe. And they leave Grady all alone in New York, and she decides to go on some rambunctious relationships with people that she meets. Uh, and she's overall not a great person, and she is very naive and gets herself into bad situations and really can't control her emotions in a very tragic way. And so the narrator does have sympathy for her, but that sympathy is not as well done as Capote has done in his later novels. So in Breast of Tiffany's, the characters really come to life, and the audience feels so strongly for Holly Golightly, even though she's not a great person in that novel. Uh, we very clearly understand why she is the way she is, and she has this just magnetism to her that makes us want to read more about her. In the same sense, he applies that lens to the the uh, criminals, and perpetrators in, in Cold Blood, and you really, really see the world the way they see it. I see attempts to do that with Grady here, and it's just not as effective because it's earlier in his career, and it's just not as clear what the purpose of a book like this is, um, and it just doesn't work quite as well. I think it's interesting as a historical curiosity, but I would not go out of your way to read this. Even if you do love Truman Capote, it's not a great Truman Capote novel. I would give it a 3 out of 5. So time has passed. Time has uh, has really passed. So the last time I did this video last year, I had a very detailed and regimented way of making this, and I would do one little snippet every day or every couple of days to make sure I stayed on top of things, and this year has not worked that way. This year it really hasn't, uh, but let's try and keep up. It's a bit bad in that I think I'm about three or four books behind at this moment, and my life is a lot busier this year to the point where I feel like it'd be quite irresponsible to try and push through and actually do 29 books this month, but I will keep trying. I'll see how close I can get. I'm not guaranteeing 29, but I don't know. I don't know. I might make some concessions, see how things go. Book number eight is Fences by August Wilson. I've really been meaning to read this recently, so I've been trying to read more plays, I'm trying to get more knowledgeable about theatre because that's one of the only mediums that I feel like I'm not that well versed in. I know a lot about fiction, now I learn a lot about poetry. Non-fiction is a bit of a gap for me, and so is theatre. So August Wilson's Fences very famously won the Pulitzer Prize? I want to say the Pulitzer Prize for drama. Yes, and it is about a historical setting when it is set in the 1950s, and it's about a patriarch of an African-American family who is who still kind of remembers the way things were, and it very much interrogates this idea of generational trauma and masculinity, so the role of a traditional masculine figure to protect the family, provide for the family, to set a good standard for the rest of the generation to come, and how that difficulty is how much difficulty that is create how much difficulty arises from that very strong sense of masculinity and desire to achieve something that historically has been denied from African American people compared to the white counterparts so we see our protagonist try to live his way through his life and just keep everything together but his shortcomings really prevent this from happening so it's a very tragic type of story you really feel the pain in some of these characters and just the emotional density of some of these situations there are some really powerful speeches and just from reading the script alone i really really welled up like i i really felt it i genuinely felt so much sympathy for these characters recognize how difficult the situation was and it didn't feel unnecessarily sentimental or uh, exploitative about their experiences. It just felt very genuine, and it's just a very, very well-written play. I'd give it an easy 5 out of 5. I would love to see this performed one day. I would cry buckets, though. I would just absolutely get to me, but it is fantastic. 5 out of 5. Genuinely recommend this. Absolutely recommend this. Lots of adverbs there. Too many adverbs. Book number 9 is the Redluck... Book number nine is The Reluctant Fundamentalist by Mohsin Hamid. You can't really see the title unless they hold it very carefully. Uh, this is fun. This is a thriller that's set and takes place kind of around 9-11 towards after 9-11. It stars a Pakistani migrant to New York, and it is really about his own personal turmoil working in this big investment company and 
the engagement that has with this idea of the global north and the global south, so the idea of the Western world, so to speak, having power and influence over various countries like Pakistan, like us, countries in South America, countries in the Middle East, countries in Africa, where the influence of money and investment stratifies the world into people who have it and people who, who are controlled by other larger powers. And so we have this protagonist who's kind of stuck between these two worlds, uh, trying to work his way up the corporate ladder, but also very cognizant of the very moral things that he's been asked to do. And all amongst this, we have the aftermath of 9-11 and the way that Muslim Americans are treated in this very difficult time. So this book came out in, I think, 2007. It's very, very topical for the Islamophobia of the 2000s, the early 2000s, but it is not a very polemical thriller type book. If anything, I feel like the marketing of this book is a little bit... Um, it does the actual novel a disservice, so calling it The Reluctant Fundamentalist, making the cover page like this, really amping up the idea that it is a story about being Muslim in America. It isn't all about all these things, but it is also a fairly straightforward political thriller, literary fiction, contemporary thing. I don't think that this book should be responsible for addressing or fixing all the complexities of Islamophobia in the Western world or in the global north. And I think that a lot of American readers and American college courses have expected it to do so, when in reality I feel like it's quite a simple introduction to a Western audience about much larger and more complex issues. Like, I definitely feel like that the ideas tackled in this book have been tackled to greater depth and greater interest in literary fiction, but I would put this and categorize this alongside things like the one that immediately comes to mind is the White Tiger. I don't think it's a good comparison, especially because the White Tiger is about India and it's about Pakistan. But the idea of a introductory book to Western audiences about a particular culture and the problems faced by that culture, but in such a straightforward way as to be more universal to audiences that might not necessarily be interested in that culture. So. This book, I would say, definitely succeeded because of its association to Islamophobia in post-9-11 America. I did absolutely want to be deeper, but for what we got, it's a well-written book. It's really brisk, it's straightforward, it captures your attention, really pushes you along. In fact, it finds a way to make personal crises of values and faith just as compelling as literal crises of violence. So I think it's done well, could be a lot denser and stronger, but for what it is, it's very successful. I would give it a 4 out of 5. Book number 10, Around the World in 80 Days. <laughs> what is this book? Uh, it's so bizarre, so funny. So the premise is very well known. We have Phileas Fogg, who makes a bet with the Rotary Club in Britain of all things. Rotary Club? Something else? I don't know. The Reform Club. Makes a bet with them that he can travel around the world in 80 days. This is around the time when the railroads were being built all around the world to the um, through then British controlled India and across to the regions of China and Japan and then uh, cruise liners across the Atlantic Ocean back to Britain. So this is around the time when that kind of circumnavigation from a private individual just was becoming possible. And so we have this narrative that exaggerates the kind of speed that we can achieve this through Phileas Fogg, this narrator who is just a, such a strange dude, such a bizarre dude. Um, not a lot of personality, but very, very determined. And that's contrasted against Passepartout, who is his helper. And having read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, I thought that Passepartout would be like, Conseil would be like this absolute bro assisting everything. Uh, Passepartout is an idiot. Passepartout <laughs> creates all the conflict of this novel by just being completely incompetent. And so he gets... Uh, he gets Phileas Fogg wanted by the police, and then they chase all the way around the world, and it's just this goofy, bizarre, maniacal romp of a novel. Funnily enough, well, before we get to the funny, it's really racist. It's very, very racist. It's, it's so exoticized when it looks at every culture that is not English or French. So the narrator is um, English, Passepartout is French. It takes Europe as the home base, and it has just some of the most caricatured views of every non-white race imaginable. So 
it does India a great disservice, it does China a great disservice, it does Japan a great disservice, it does the Native Americans a very great disservice. Um, if you can kind of look past that, then there are still lots of funny, capery moments there. Um, but the, the various locations visited by these characters are fantastical. They're, they're, they're not supposed to be a real representation of culture, although you can imagine in the 1800s when this book was published and became huge, probably didn't do great to express these cultures well to a French and English audience that would not have traveled there. So damaging, problematic book, but also very lighthearted and very fun. Um, I would give it a three out of five. Also tangent, but at no point in this book do they get into a hot air balloon. I don't know why all the marketing for all the various forms of this novel includes hot air balloons. Uh, hot air balloon very famously features in the film adaptation with Jackie Chan in it. The Jackie Chan film is a lot more faithful than I thought it would be. I thought it would just be a based off and then a bunch of random stuff that happens, but no, the energy of the film is so similar to the energy of the book that it actually feels like a very good adaptation. Uh, but tangents aside, why would you ever use a hot air balloon if you needed to travel around the world in eight days? That's like one of the slowest forms of transportation. Why would you voluntarily do that? And yet, everybody's been fooled into thinking that there's a hot air balloon in this novel. There is no hot air balloon in this novel. I don't know if Jules Verne ever wrote about hot air balloons, but it, one doesn't feature here. Book number 11, Bridges Over Madison County. The Bridges of Madison County? I don't know the name of the novel. By Robert James Waller. So, I've talked not much about the romance genre, and the romance genre is one that I personally don't know a lot of, but I do have a lot of friends who quite enjoy the genre, and I try to read it, I try to understand what it's about, and I do respect a good romance novel, but I think the romance novel and genre has been done dirty by publishers so much over the past years, and there are lots of books in this genre that are just Bad. and this one is one of them. It's just not a very good book. So we follow Robert Kincaid, who is a photographer for National Geographic. He makes money by selling photographs to this nature magazine, and he travels all around um, America and the world, and he goes to Iowa, and he wants to photograph these bridges. And while he's in Iowa, he meets this Iowa, Ohio? Iowa. Uh, in Iowa, he meets this housewife whose husband is a war veteran but is away, and they have a very passionate steaming love affair for about a week's time. And that's really it. Like, our protagonist is this rugged fantasy man that just happens to have the same name as the author, and the desire that the housewife Francesca has for him is just really kind of unfounded because. To me, it reads like Sigma male propaganda, right? It reads like being this rugged, do-it-yourself kind of man, and just by being that figure, you are so utterly irresistible to women that they will just fall head over heels over you, and fall in love with you for no good reason, and leave the husbands, and just, it's, it's just not well done. It's just not well phrased. The passages, too, are a little bit heavy-handed, there's one passage where Robert is kind of explaining his philosophy of life towards Francesca, and it's like a two-page long dialogue of just him explaining what's wrong with the world, and you're supposed to view this character as a good person, as a desirable person, and it just didn't work for me at all. I just couldn't believe this relationship could ever possibly be real at all. It was just so out of touch with how I think relationships work, and yet this is a massive bestseller. And from what I've heard, the Clint Eastwood movie that adapts this is actually kind of good. It actually has more subtlety that I guess you can achieve on screen and it's much easier to hide compared to the lack of subtlety on the page. So this gets a 2 out of 5. Don't read this. Don't pick it up anywhere. You see this in a used bookstore, just leave it alone. Ignore the hype. It's not good. Book number 12 is The Fat Man in History by Peter Carey. This is a book of short stories that is very surreal and very Australian. So. How do I explain this? It is written in the 1970s, I believe, and it predicts a lot of the movements towards technology and consumerism that would affect Australia. Now, Peter Carey is a very famous Australian writer that I haven't read very much of. I wonder if this is actually my first book of his that I've finished. I think it is, actually. So, I was prescribed 
two stories in this collection at university. One is called Crabs, which is a very bizarre read. It rem- it feels like a precursor to Mad Max because it's about a couple that goes to a driving cinema and they get stranded there because this strange car thieving cult has taken their wheels and bureaucracy prevents anybody from getting their wheels back. It's such a strange story and a lot of the stories in this collection work like that so they combine this banality of modern life with just bizarre occurrences and sometimes it's very very funny. My favorite story is called what is it called? I don't remember. It's about horses. It's called Life and Death in the Southside Pavilion. It's only six pages long. It is about a strange occurrence where a worker at a carnival realizes that every time he has sex, a horse walks into the pool and dies. And it's, so it's about this weird moral quandary about him not having sex to save horses. It's just so ludicrous. It's so funny. There's a line in that story that just made me burst out laughing. And I genuinely didn't think I would laugh at any book this year, but it did it, right? Um, It's such a mix. It's got some funny bits, some scary bits, some very xenophobic undertones. I guess it was written in the 70s when the White Australia policy was being repealed very recently, so I don't know. But if you can look past the racism, there's some fun things to be had here. I would give it a 3 out of 5. That score isn't just about the racism, by the way. These are not always amazing stories. Sometimes they are hard to follow, sometimes they are a bit... Indulgent is what I would say. Sometimes a bit too symbolic for their own good, but when it does land, it can be very effective. Book number 13 is The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. This collection has two other short stories. I did not read those short stories. So The Red Badge of Courage is a war novel set in the American Civil War following the Union Army and the young soldiers there. It is, well, primarily about one soldier called Henry, but the novel so insistently calls him the youth that to me it feels like it's trying to dehumanize it and de-individualize it and instead be a bit more of a universal narrative about youth and conflict. So what's interesting about this is it is very much a realistic reportage inspired representation of the Civil War. Even though Stephen Crane wasn't alive for the Civil War, he is trying to be very true to the experience of the soldiers on the field. It is, however, not at all about the politics or the intention behind the Civil War. It doesn't talk about the motivations of the Union Army or the Confederate Army at all, really, except for the fact that there are soldiers that are on opposite sides and wear different uniforms. But the implications of what each army is fighting for is really glossed over. And as a historical document or as a representation of a period of history, that to me feels a bit lacking. But if we set that aside and just take this as a novel about literally any war that just happens to be set in the American the American Civil War, then we follow Henry, who is a young soldier, and he is very conflicted about his role fighting and putting himself at risk for a cause that he clearly doesn't understand very fully. And so in the very first conflict, he runs away and he deserts his regiment he thinks at first that he's done the smart thing because they weren't ever going to win, but then they find out the regiment survives. So, so now he comes back and he's really self-conscious about how everybody around him is wounded and he isn't. The Red Badge of Courage, to spoil the symbol of the title, is a bullet wound. So everybody has this badge of courage through this bleeding that they're doing, and Henry, Henry suddenly is very self-conscious about the fact that he is not wounded. That might reveal the fact that he deserted. So the novel develops from there. He's very young at the start, and he becomes more experienced as a soldier as he survives more battles, and as he does more in this conflict. Towards the end, it makes some very grim statements about the nature of war, the nature of military conflict, especially with the advent of firearms, and how that changes the magnitude of death, and the impersonableness of death, that it no longer is a fight about beliefs and values, it is now just a fight from a great distance, that is totally detached from the people that are actually fighting and dying for it. So it's a very heavy-handed reading experience. I find it quite difficult to get through because it is trying to do that intentionally. It is trying to be shocking, it is trying to hurt the reader, and for what it's worth that is effective, I can... I know this is taught very often in the American syllabus, I can kind of see why. Like it 
feels like a precursor to the John Steinbeck school of writing where it's a very deliberate use of narrative images and symbols to try and push an emotional response that also pushes a political agenda. And it's fine, it's okay, it's interesting as a historical document, it's not the most engaging of works, I would give it a 3 out of 5. Book number 14, Swallow the Air by Tarajan Winch. This really hurt. This is a story about a young Aboriginal girl who, through vignettes, we find out the difficulty she has in living in her community and being detached from her original community, and then over the course of a life, struggles with the justice system, struggles with homelessness, and eventually risks it to reconnect with an old community when she doesn't have a lot of other tethers to the people around her. It's a really emotional, really painful experience, and it's made more real by the fact that these experiences, to me, first I've learned about them factually through high school, through my own engagement with Aboriginal Australian history, and the writing is quite beautiful, it's really well done. The sentences and the images are just tough enough that it requires a little bit of interpretation, but it's not so overwritten that it requires, well, that it impedes your progress. Like, it's still very easy to read, but there are many attempts made to extend the emotional reach of some of the passages to just beyond the literal. And that, for the most part, worked for me. I felt like most chapters had a strong emotional pull for me that really leapt off the page. Um, it's a bit harder to follow in terms of narrative structure because it is told in vignettes and it is a little bit sparse. It does mirror the lack of understanding the protagonist has as well, that the reader ideally would know more about the social causes that lead them into the situation, whereas the narrator is just trying to find a way through. And so the tragedy works on those two angles. We understand what is happening to her and we are sad because of that, but we're also sad at the fact that she doesn't understand, she hasn't had a lot of this explained to her, she doesn't actually feel the same sadness that we do because the implications are just not as clear to her as they are to us. And this is all done really well. It's a very powerful first novel written when the author was quite young and published in 2006, so one of the more successful, I don't want to say earlier, but definitely in a literary environment where there was much less Aboriginal fiction being successful compared to today. And I loved The Yield when I read it last year. Tara June Lynch is a very, very talented writer. And this book to me now feels like a precursor to The Yield based on how much I loved that novel. It feels like practicing. It feels like a debut that is establishing the kind of voice and emotional effects that this author is good at. Uh, but from here, it gives hope for the future, but it is by no means what I would say a definitive novel for this author. So I would give it a four out of five, worth a read, but definitely read The Yield first. I love The Yield, and a lot of the techniques that are developed here are further refined and like made much more powerful in The Yield. So it's February 21, and that's 14 books. There are a few that I haven't been able to review today because busy and they're in various places, but I am still quite behind. I have read 17 books this month, and it's going to take some time to catch up. So what I think I might do is work in some poetry, work in some theatre, things that I can read in a single train ride instead of across day, and we'll see how things go. Okay, it's a few days later, and I have somewhat caught up, so it is still behind, but a bit better. First one is Eugene Onegin by Alexander Pushkin. I didn't really know that much about it. This is a verse novel, and it was originally written in Russian. It is built up of a bunch of different stanzas, and it tells the story of the title character, Eugene Onegin, who is a kind of a really kind of remarkable person. And it's about the relationship that he has with a young woman and her family. So it's interesting to me to have a verse novel that is quite realistic. It is not like a fantastical kind of story. It is a very naturalistic story about two people in a relationship and the kinds of conflicts that arise from it. It just happens to be told in verse. Now, this version I have is translated by Charles Johnston. It's quite an old edition, actually. I think I bought this in a thrift store. It was originally published in, I want to guess, well, the original poem was published in the 1800s, but this translation was done in the 
I believe the 1970s, no, 1977. And it's difficult because Eugene Onegin and Alexander Pushkin wrote in Russian rhymes and that never really translates well to English. Some translators, very famously uh, Vladimir Novikov, translated it literally or trying to preserve the meaning of the words but failing to preserve the meter and the rhyme. Whereas this translator, Charles Johnson, tries to keep the rhyme, the meter, and something about this doesn't work with me. I just feel like rhyme in English is not a particularly aesthetic technique, I would think. Rhyme in English to me is quite whimsical. It creates feelings of lightheartedness and joy, and it really doesn't gel well with how serious this narrative is. This narrative feels like it's trying to make social commentary and trying to talk more deeply about the nature of love and social class. And the rhyme just doesn't really work, it just it keeps distracting me because I feel like so many words are kind of forced there to make the rhyme work. And it lends itself to this kind of childish vibe that I just didn't really gel with. I think I would give this a 2 out of 5 based on my enjoyment of it, though I know that this is such a well-respected novel, or well-respected verse novel, I just think that the translation lets it down a lot, because I don't feel the way that I feel like the author intends for me to feel. Instead, I'm just often quite distracted, and it really knocks me out of the appreciation of the narrative and the meaning of the novel, because of just how often the phrasing and the syntax and the grammar and everything is just so weird because of the rhyme choice. And there are only so many words in English that rhyme neatly, and this translation also tries to retain a more modern sense of English. And it just never comes together. I never found it beautiful, and I was just struggling with the fact that the underlying narrative of Eugene Onegin and his role in society, that seemed quite serious. But the words themselves that are being chosen just felt a bit too clumsy. And I think that I can never really experience this novel properly unless I learn Russian and read in Russian. I wonder if the more literal Nabokov version retains some of the gravitas that the original had. But yeah, I don't know. Just Unfortunately for this translation, this didn't really do it for me. Book number 16 is Where Angels Fear to Tread by E.M. Foster. E.M. Foster's first novel and the one where he is establishing his style. So E.M. Foster is known for being a writer that straddles between the Victorian and the modernist eras. He's working sort of within Victorian social realism, but questioning the kinds of sensibilities of the Victorian era in a way that is quite light and breezy and easy to follow. He was very successful in his time because his works can be read as straight romances and really quite enjoyable ones. It didn't feel like you are being forced to consider some big social issues like Thomas Hardy or whatever. Um, instead, it's very bright and easy and enjoyable, and it's something that if you're not interested in the historical period or the questions of social class, you can still pick it up and have a pretty good time. And this novel, I think, works that way, just not as well as some of his later works. I didn't like it quite as much as A Passage to India or A Room of the View. I thought both those novels managed to balance that lightness with some seriousness and complexity quite well. This one is a lot more unpredictable because he engages with this idea of issuing traditional plot structures. It doesn't feel so refined that you can predict what happens next. So we follow, at first, Lilia, who's this wealthy English widow, and she goes off on holiday to Italy and marries this Italian son of a dentist, so like, some, like a mid-middle-class kind of person. And the rest of her English family is just absolutely horrified at this. Lilia eventually gives, bo gives birth to a son, and then she passes away in childbirth. So that's actually a mid-book spoiler that I probably should have warned people about. Uh, the funny thing though is that you don't see it coming. It's just so unexpected, and this book will drop those really serious moments and decisions very quickly to the point where you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know what the arc of the story is. Even when I got halfway through, I wasn't really sure what the premise is or how to describe it just because it's so unpredictable. We have this relationship between Europe or England and Italy though, and we do have a sense that, at least for most of the novel, England has this superiority complex towards the rest of Europe and especially Italy. Some of the English characters treat the Italian characters just so terribly, so terribly. And it's abounding in stereotypes and 
improper justifications and all of that, and it takes a while for the novel to really critique this, but it does. I think that Ian Foster is writing with a big heart. He really likes people, he enjoys making characters that you feel something towards, even if they initially have really ignorant presuppositions. He refuses to make them into caricatures by the end. Like, by the end of the novel, you do get a good sense of who the people are, why they are the way they are, and it is still quite lovely. But I think it's not so refined as his later works to make me think, oh, I know where this is going. I know what's... I, I have a sense of refinement, right? It's not like the later works where I read it and I'm very clearly on board. This one is a little bit hard to follow from the beginning, so I would give it a 3 out of 5. Book number 17 is The Power and the Glory by Graham Greene. Now this one was a bit longer, it took me three days to finish, so I'm still kind of behind. But this is about a region in southern Mexico and a not very good Catholic priest who is on the run from the government because the government at that point had outlawed Catholicism. And so we follow this character who is conflicted between his role as a religious figure in a place where he's being persecuted, contrasted with the fact that he's not a very good priest. And the fact that he's not very good leads him to conflict. So Graham Greene's an interesting writer. He's writing the modernist era. He's actually published this during World War II, which I don't really understand how it happens. But he is, on one hand, quite a good thriller writer, and on the other hand, quite a modernist philosophical writer. And this book, which is often regarded as his best one, it reconciles those two spheres. So it does function as a thriller, robbing your way through southern Mexico and just being hunted by the police, but at the same time it is a very densely philosophical work. It is very much about situations the priest finds himself in and needs to make decisions about what loyalties does he have. Does he have loyalties to himself or to compassion to people around him or his more ceremonial duties as a Catholic priest? It's complicated. It makes you think quite a bit. Now, if I do have a complaint, and maybe it's because I'm reading this in my book a month book a day month, and I'm rushing, but it's frustratingly slow for a thriller. I wish it was a little bit faster, because there are lots of scenes where characters just kind of talk at each other, and there's a lot of dialogue, and you do need to pass what the motivations and the meaning is, and it can be easy to lose momentum in those situations. There are some fantastic scenes that are really, really tense, but there are also breaks in between them where you're not fully sure what the direction is or where everything's going. I did think that the ending was really beautiful though, really quite brilliant in how it was done. I can't speak very closely to the Catholicism aspect of it. I know that Graham Greene is quite a controversial figure in terms of Catholicism. Uh, there could be a much more interesting dynamic to the story that I'm just not really getting. But for what it is, a philosophical thriller through southern Mexico that goes some places that I really didn't think it would go, I give it a 4 out of 5. I think it's worthwhile, worth thinking looking at. Kind of unusual for my reading patterns, but it all comes together. I, don't, I didn't hate it. Okay, book number 17. This is really cheating. I'm going to cheat so much towards the end of this month. This is a collection of four major plays by Henry Idsman. I have read a single one, A Doll's House. So I know A Doll's House because it's prescribed on the Year 12 syllabus and it has been for a while. It is the play to represent plays, effectively. And I knew a little bit about Henry Ibsen from doing drama in high school. I knew that he was a realist or a naturalist. He likes to present normal people in real situations and present human drama as a contrast to the much more well-produced uh, French classical or Shakespearean styles. He was a move towards realism. And A Doll's House is okay. So premise-wise, we have Nora, who is a... Well, she's married to Torvald, and they have this very weird relationship where Torvald treats Nora kind of like a doll, kind of like his pet. He pampers her and spoils her and puts her in a situation where she never really needs to think for herself. And Nora wants to, or has dreams of, being a compassionate wife and going out of her way to help her husband, and actually financially does secretly do so. But we get a sense that she's too naive to be a very effective person, and she's also diminished so much by Torvald's influence that she never really gets to be her own person. 
And so the, the core conflict of this novel has to do with money, has to do with what Nora is doing with money that she's borrowed and how the ramifications of that might affect her relationship with Torvald because Torvald is a very famous banker with some influence in the area and it's fine, it's okay, it's, I'm really bothered by, for the most part of the play, the depiction of Nora as this really ignorant and naive woman that I feel like hampers on a lot of stereotypes of women in the era. She does get better as the story develops, but I do feel like some of the the generalizations towards Nora as a character and how she's portrayed, especially in the very beginning, are just quite frustrating. The conversation that she has between Torvald and herself is sometimes just painful to read because you'd get a sense that the author, who's making these actors and actresses say these things, has so little respect for the kind of people they are that, or at the very least, shows them in a way that's much less intelligent than the average writer or viewer might see them. It's very frustrating. I didn't feel in a strong emotional pull because I didn't feel like the play was really taking them seriously. Even though it's meant to be realistic, I saw them as a bit of a caricature, and I wonder if it's because I'm not understanding the context quite as well, I don't understand so clearly exactly how the economics of the situation worked out, but it just didn't do it for me. I was irritated much more than I was affected. The monologues towards the end are really beautiful, but maybe I missed something. I was surprised that they arrived at that point. It didn't feel so much like an arc as it is kind of like a levy breaking. Maybe I'm not understanding it well enough. And I did mention before, I haven't read a lot of plays. I would love to read more plays. But this one, for all the recognition that it's gotten, I just don't fully get it. Uh, I'd give it a three out of five. Book number 19, The Happy Prince and Other Stories by Oscar Wilde. So I use The Nighting on the Road, the short story, in my lesson plans quite often because I think that story is a lot of fun and all the different reactions that provokes out of people. It's very exaggerated, it's very melodramatic, um, and it creates stronger emotions because Oscar Wilde is writing towards the end of the Victorian period. He is, well, he has no filter. He's making fun of all the Victorian attitudes towards love and courtship and social class. And he's using these fairy tales that are very, very twisted and very unusual in order to try and poke at the fabric of the society. So they are ostensibly for children, but I feel like adults would enjoy this a lot more just because of how much sly humor is woven into each of these stories and how there are just undertones of darkness in how everything's portrayed. It's very funny. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Oscar Wilde's style. I gave A Picture of Dorian Gray three out of five. Because of how annoyed it was at his style of just having talking heads, I feel like a lot of his prose has characters just standing there giving long monologues to each other, and this collection of stories is very similar. It has characters that just give long speeches at each other, sometimes stories within stories where the speeches just go on and on and on, and to me it just doesn't mirror the rhythms of a realistic conversation. Now I get that Oscar Wilde is writing a melodrama, I get that it's meant to be stylized, I get that the dialogue itself, if I was just to break it down into its words and its phrases, is quite beautiful, but I can't see it in my head. I can't imagine it. I don't get immersed. And I know that I'm not really supposed to with fairy tales, but it just doesn't have that evocative quality that I really love out of fiction. So this one gets a 3 out of 5 for me as well. Some stories are a lot better than others. Some stories really stand out. I was so surprised at The Fisherman in the Soul. That one went to places that I did not think it was going to go. But overall, as a collection, I would not necessarily say it's essential. I would give it a 3 out of 5. Lastly, for this session, and you bet I'm cheating now, this is a collection of two short, two uh, novellas by Georges Breck, a um, French writer. Things, sorry, the 60s and A Man Asleep. I actually can't find these novels published by themselves. They're always collected, at least the translated English versions, collected together in this two novel book. I'm going to count both of these as separate novels, just for the sake of this reading challenge. So this first video, I'm going to talk about Things, a study of this, what is it? Things, a story of the 60s. Georges Perec is known for being part of the Aleppo movement, and this is a kind of mathematical, theoretical movement that looks at literature in a more formalist lens. So they do things like strange structures, weird perspectives. One of the other well-known Aleppo writers is Italo Covino, which 
who's really known for playing with form. And George is correct, one of his more famous novels is A Void, which is a novel that doesn't use the letter E. Uh, Things is his first novel, and it doesn't have that same sense of formal experimentation that he's known for, but it is still a little bit weird. So we follow a, we follow a named but somewhat personalityless couple, and they're growing up in Paris, France. They define their happiness and their wealth and their lot in life based on their possessions. So the first chapter before we even meet the characters is a very lavish depiction of their house and all the decorations in their house and how you can understand them as people based on what they own and what they buy. And over time, we see this value system break down because of the Algerian war and the main characters then move to Tunisia. This actually happens quite late in the novel. But we see the destabilization of this value where at first they were quite bourgeois, they liked to advance their social capital by buying things, and then we see that erode and we see how that changes them as history prevents this from being such a viable way of looking at life. So it's really quite an intelligent novel, and I was surprised at how easy it is to read as well. The translation helps a lot, but it's just very brisk. It is slyly funny, it is really quite evocative at times as well. You see their environment so clearly, you really understand the kind of people that they are, the way they value their objects, and the way that this affects the way they see the world. I really enjoyed it. I thought that it was a clear, very easy to follow novel, that it said what it wanted to say really well. I give it a four or a five. I'm about to lose it. So I just recorded four reviews without my computer's recording being on and without my microphone being plugged in. So all this time has been wasted. I'm just gonna rush quickly through this. I'm actually gonna finish it. I think I'm gonna finish it. So today is the 28th of August. I've read 27 books, which means that I still have some time tonight to read a bit more and tomorrow I can finish two books and it will be done. There is a lot of cheating, I will admit. I have dipped more into poetry and theatre than I would have liked. I would have liked it to be 29 novels in 29 days. That turned out to be impossible. So let's see what we've got this time. Book number 22 is Harun the Sea of Stories. So this is a children's novel by Salman Rushdie. I was very surprised because the only other novel I've read by this author is Midnight's Children. And that is not a children's novel. That is a very complicated, strange, bizarre, explicit, tedious work that requires so much work to actually get something out of. So I thought, how is this man gonna write a children's story? It's actually pretty good, I don't mind it. It reminds me a lot of Thomas Pynchon's The Crying of Lot 49, in that it's just a quest narrative where not a lot of things make sense. It exaggerates its kind of premises, and it feels like anything is possible. So the premise is that Harun is the son of a master storyteller named Rashid, and one day Rashid's wife runs out on him, and he also loses the ability to tell stories. And so Harun then, finds himself embroiled in this big quest to try and bring back the art of storytelling in this strange, dreamlike fantasy world where lots of elements of fiction, especially Middle Eastern Pakistani fiction, uh, comes to life. And so it's interesting, it's, it's detailed, it's actually very fast paced as well. It does make me feel like if I gave it to a teenager, they can enjoy it for what it is. Whereas if I gave it to an adult, there's still depth there. Because of the links to postmodernism, because of the links to the ideas of what narratives and what storytelling really is, it's clever, it's enjoyable. There's not a lot that I can complain about it. The only thing is that it does feel at times... I, I, feel, I find it hard to criticize it for being simple because it is a kid's novel. And it also isn't really talking down to children in a way that a lot of kids' novels do but the underlying moral issues do feel greatly simplified, especially because it feels like it draws a bit from the history of India and Pakistan and the war between those two nations. I can't say it's not there. Like, it's a fantasy landscape, it's a fantasy environment. It's all very mythologized. There's no real connections to the real world. But still, it's just gesturing in that direction. I just don't know what to say. It's fine. It's pretty good. I give it a 4 out of 5. Book number 23 is Oedipus the King or Oedipus Rex by Sophocles. Now I have this collection of three works and I'd read Antigone in high school reading Sophocles for the first, uh, reading, um, reading Oedipus Rex for the first time and Oedipus at Colonus. I don't know. I will read that later. But Oedipus Rex is one of the most classic of all the classic Greek tragedies. Everybody knows the story of Oedipus. He's the king who tragically killed his father and married his mother, founded psychology, basically. And so he, uh, psychoanalysis, sorry, found whatever. Uh, Oedipus 
in this play is a tragic figure because he at first before he knows who he is and what he has done he is this powerful hero who has solved the sphinx's riddle made his way to the king and then found out about the situation of somebody killing their father and marrying their mother and just is absolutely horrified at that he decrees this as a massive crime he cast aside all of the fortune tellers and the advisors that would would actually guide him to be a bit less impulsive and then later on he finds out that it is he himself that has done this horrible thing so it's one of the most archetypal greek tragedies you can imagine it has the tragic hero you have his downfall he has the hubris or the arrogance that causes him to do this you do feel like towards the end that the consequence is a bit inevitable and i think i've just studied genre too much i've studied narrative too much because this being so archetypal just doesn't really do anything for me it's it's interesting from an intellectual standpoint but it is also very predictable and very vanilla i read two translations i read this one which is a more literal version and i read a versified version well actually to cheat i read half in the versified and half in this it's interesting i think that a scholar would be able to do a lot more with it, but I also feel like there's so much that's been done already, so many interpretations, so many adaptations, so many remixes, like it's very saturated in our culture, to the point where the original just doesn't have as much power anymore. There are some works that are so classic and so ingrained in our society that still remain energetic and exciting when you read the original for the first time, and I would say this is not really one of them. This is one where you definitely feel like it's influential and it's interesting as an intellectual piece but it's not a enthralling work of literature anymore so i would give it a three out of five okay i don't have a placeholder but just imagine that this is a copy of the wind in the willows so i mostly listened to the audiobook of the wind in the willows and i read some of it towards the end i actually never really engaged with the wind of the willows as a kid it was one of those children's works that just escaped me but i know that some people genuinely love it so it was interesting for me to go back and see what it's all about. And we follow a bunch of woodland animals who just enjoy life. It's very quiet, it's very twee, it's very like regional English narrative where there's not a lot of tension. But the closest thing to a narrative arc that you really could talk about in The Wind the Willows is about Toad. Toad develops an addiction to driving cars to the point where he can't control himself and gets an intervention on him and then goes to jail. It's absolutely bizarre um to me toad feels like he is coded as a drug addict except his addiction is driving cars and for a kid's book like this is weird right this is strange it's really weird to me that he definitely has to go to an intervention he definitely develops coping mechanisms and then relapses it's it's just such a drug narrative it's just so confusing to me and i normally don't like readings where you point at something and you go that's secretly drugs but this one is just i can't ignore it i can't understand why it's just too glaringly there for me um the humor is okay i think it's a bit divisive the way the humor works so to me the humor was just a bit farcical and zany and sometimes made me laugh and sometimes just made me want to just move forward some of the dialogue can be very inane at times and overall the narrative is fine like it's delighting in the english countryside with exaggerated strange woodland animal characters it's fine it's not my favorite children's work i would give it a three out of five i've said it's fine so many times okay the next one i've lost count at this point is a wizard of earth sea so this is four of the earth sea novels collected in one omnibus and i am so happy i got this i think i got it for like what twelve dollars what a deal right so ursula Le Guin, very prolific very famous science fiction and fantasy author one of the best of the genre i would say and a wizard of earth sea is definitely a demonstration of that so it is a middle grade novel or ostensibly a middle grade novel but i would say it's relevant for everybody it's just such a master class in fantasy storytelling I personally don't love fantasy as a genre because I feel like world building tends to be at odds with narrative pacing. Sometimes I don't want to sit there and read facts about a world that is not relevant to ours. And A Wizard of Earthsea just dodges that problem perfectly. It has a wizard as a main character who is developing his powers and is very human in that he has the flaw of arrogance. He 
he finds himself unusually strong and is trained up to be like that, but his desire for knowledge and his desire to prove himself more powerful than others results in him being haunted by this shadow. And so for the entire novel, really, it's about him and the various moral conflicts that are involved with conquering the shadow, which for him is a very selfish thing, contrasted against the ways that his powers can be used for good for all the people around him. So the world is actually very developed. It's an archipelago, and it has all these different locations, different languages and people groups. Very interesting to me that the protagonist and most of the characters are dark-skinned as well. But it's just such an interesting world. There's distance from all you would assume with fantasy. It's not like the Tolkien-esque Middle Earth, Merry England type of fantasy. It is just very different, very unexpected, but it doesn't feel bogged down in well-being at all. The plot is actually very fast-paced. I read this really quickly, and it's been a long while since I've felt that kind of compulsive page-turning vibe when I read a book, where after each chapter, I genuinely think I want to read the next one because I want to know what happens next. I never, I never get that anymore. And I love that this book was able to revitalize this in me a little bit. And I love that there's another five of them, or four of them. So, very excited. I give it a five out of five. Definitely check it out. Even if you're not a fan of fantasy, it is just good. It's it's like a very, very good vanilla. It's just the basics done excellently. Uh, excellently paced, excellently worded, good world building, good characterization, good plotting, just everything is good. It's not a case of unexpected, blew my mind, changed my view on the world, but it is just a case of I can't fault it. It is just so, so well done. Book number 26, going back to George's Perec, is uh, A Man Asleep. Now, Things a study of the 60s, a story of the 60s, was social commentary, like I feel like it was very political and quite basic in what it was trying to do, like structurally it wasn't that unique and thematically it was very familiar. A Man Asleep is a bit weirder, so we follow, well, actually we're in second person, we're second person inhabiting a 25 year old male student who is just wanting to not exist. He stays in his room, does nothing, avoids all social interaction, and just wants to be less and less of a human. And from there, it gets more and more existential to the idea of what is a human, really? Are you a human because you can be observed? Are you a human because you have body parts? Do you have feelings? Do you have goals and motivations each day? Can you eliminate all of these? And when you do, do you get a sense of absolution? Because there is a definite cynicism in A Man Asleep where the influences of culture and the world around and the ideas of what you need to do to be a human and to self-actualize. A Man Asleep to me is the logical opposite of self-actualization. It's how can I run away from being a human being and what are the ramifications of doing that? So to me it's very existential. I would only really recommend it in the lens of other postmodern works if you compare this with uh, Camus the Outsider, or if you compare it with more modern something like uh, Otessa Moshfeg's uh, My Year of Rest and Realization, which premise-wise is actually almost identical to A Man Asleep. They do very different things, they achieve very different things. A Man Asleep is a little bit funny, but a lot commentary, whereas My Year of Rest and Relaxation is a little bit commentary, but a lot funny. It's this idea of what is the purpose of leaving society and not becoming a human and just lying in bed and doing nothing and being a vegetable. Like, what is the ultimate end of doing that? And what does it say about the society that the person is living in and the book is written in? It's fine. It's an intellectual exercise. I give it a three out of five. There are funny moments, there are sad moments, there is just, to be honest, kind of repetitive. It's a, it's a book which, even though it's so short, felt like it's a bit longer than it needed to be. I think it might have just been a short story, but anyway. 35. For 37, so now I'm really cheating. Ariel by Sylvia Plath. I've never read the whole thing, but I have read the six poems that are prescribed in the HSC syllabus so many times. So many times. I studied Sylvia Plath in year 11 of high school, and then studied Ted Hughes in year 12, which is kind of like studying Sylvia Plath again, and then studied, well, studied at uni a little bit, and then had to teach it all the way through, and it's... I've gone through a lot of ups and downs with Sylvia Plath. I think in year 11, being the very uninformed, young, straight man that I was. I didn't respect Sylvia Plath, I thought that her work was, and I hate to say this, I think I actually at the time used the word hysterical. 
it was just very emotional and it didn't gel with what I wanted poetry to be at the time. At the time, I liked craft. I liked very, very overt demonstrations of literary and, and skill, right? I just wanted to see an author use language in a way that was skillful. And to me, Ariel didn't really fit in that category because it was so emotional, because it was so direct, that it would actually break conventions and structures in order to do that. And so at university, when I read it again, or read some of the poems again, I liked it a lot more, and I came to respect it mostly out of guilt for my incorrect attitudes for it before. And now having taught it a bit more, I think I can kind of put it more into perspective. So I don't love Sylvia Plath, and I know that she's probably one of the most popular poets, if not the most popular poet ever. I think if you go to any bookstore, this is the collection that you can find guaranteed of all different collections of poetry. I would say that Sylvia Plath's Ariel is up there, right? I think that it's probably one of the most read poetry collections, one of the most understood poetry collections, and it's good. It's well made, and the emotions come across really clearly. A lot of the images are quite extreme, which for some people captures their imagination and for other people can be quite off-putting. I think originally for me it was quite off-putting and even now today I look at some of the poems and I know the history behind Sylvia Plath and I know what she's going through and I know how difficult that would have been and I look at some of the images and I think this is quite extreme. I think the comparisons to Nazi Germany, the overemphasis of suicide is just overbearing to the point that this book sometimes goes too far and just bounces off the reader. Of course, it's a matter of taste and different people experience it at a different time. I think it's a genuinely very important work and I do think that more and more people should read it and engage with it. I just wouldn't call it my personal favorite poetry collection. I would understand if someone said it was their favorite collection of poetry, but I would like to recommend a more diverse set of readings in order to achieve that. So I would give this a 3 out of 5. I think it's required reading for anyone who wants to go into poetry or understand poetry better. It's definitely one of the most influential, one of the most meaningful books of poetry. Maybe the same as with Oedipus the King, is that I've just had too much time with the various poems of it and with the history of Sylvia Plath, that having read this for the first time, it just doesn't have as much power and effect as it could have or it should have for me. Maybe someone else has a better take on this than I do, but I would give it a 3 out of 5. Okay, it's currently 6.07 p.m. on February 29, and book number 26, or 20, 28, book number 28 is Moon Tiger by Penelope Lively. So I don't actually know this author very well, but this book did win the Man Booker Prize in something or another, some year. Winner of the book prize does not say which year. But it was published in da, 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 1987. So when did it win? Um, this is interesting. So this is a... To be honest, I feel like the Book of Prize is a bit of a type. And this book fits in that type very, very distinctly. So it is about a aging historian writer who's on her deathbed and she decides to write a history of the world, and by doing that, we go back in time and start to get a sense of who she is, what her main influences are, what kind of person she is, and what influences have had the most impact on her life. I feel like I'm repeating myself because that's kind of what it is, is that a lot of Booker Prize winners like this, they are quite individualized, personal looks at humanity, mortality, and most importantly, memory, this idea of the unreliable narrator pops up so much in all of the Booker Prize winners, I feel like more than half of them, at least, have something to do with this idea of memory, whether it is about being an unreliable narrator or about the way that we remember things differently or the way that we change over time because of our memories. It's just such a key and predictable theme that this book, especially having read and, and writes The Gathering last year, last month, it feels like it fits in that pattern, it feels very similar. and. The interesting about, thing about this is that it is a little bit experimental, so it does feature World War II, a lot of the Booker Prize winners do feature World War II. It is about this historian who has this young love named Tom, who is a cannoneer of something to do with tanks, a tank mechanic in the war in the North Africa campaign, 
and after the fact, uh, he passes away quite young, and she then remarries a man named Jasper, who is very intense, but they have a very distant relationship. The protagonist, her name's Claudia, has a daughter named Lily, Lil, Lila, Lisa, Lisa. <laughs> so bad at names, Lisa, and. It's mostly looking at her family and her life in a very, very non-linear way. So the time skips are frequent and apparent. It's not as if you're going back and forth in the chapter. Usually we go back and forth in a paragraph. So if there's ever this kind of line break here, that almost invisible line break, then we're jumping either forwards or backwards in time. And it's difficult to follow. It's actually quite interesting the way that it uses repetition. So some passages across the book are repeated except changed only a little slight bit. And it brings you this feeling of deja vu. It's actually a lot better, I feel like, having read it quickly. Is that the construction is interesting. It's a little bit experimental. It's just different enough for me to enjoy it, but I am being a bit cynical. It's a bit familiar. So I would give it a three out of five. It's fine. I think if you have like a strong emotional connection to stories about memory and to stories about lost, lost loves and world wars, then it's of course better for that. But having read quite a few books like this, it's not my favorite of all the, all the categories. So I would give it a three out of five. And book number 29, I finished this five or so minutes ago. This is a collection of contemporary indigenous plays, and I read only one of them. I read Rainbow's End by Jane Harrison. Jane Harrison is the author of Stolen, which is an absolutely devastating Australian play about the Stolen generation in Australia and the ways that conflict and trauma kind of manifests intergenerationally. It's a genuinely very affecting play. And also, interestingly, one of the only times I've seen smell being used in theatre. So in Stolen, this recurring motif of a smell of Lysol or a cleaning product kind of been wafted over the audience. And I thought that was very interesting. Uh, but Rainbow's End is a play that I should be familiar with because it's been prescribed in the HSC syllabus for a very, very long time. As of right now, I'm pretty sure it's still on it in Text and Human Experiences or, or EALD or something like that. But it was there when I was in high school, which is more, well, more than 10 years ago. It seems to me to be written in the time when reconciliation and justice for Aboriginal Australians was on an upwards trajectory because it is a very hopeful play and it works very well as a light kind of slice of life. So we follow three generations of young Aboriginal women. We have uh, Nandia, who's the eldest, the grandmother. We have Gladys, who is the mother, and we have Dolly, who's this teenage daughter. And they live together in a humpy, which is like a, a house by the river. And they are affected by Western influences to their town, even though their own community is very familial and very tight-knit and very Aboriginal. And we follow the... well, the main plot is about the romance between Errol, who is traveling a cyclopedia salesman, and he, interestingly, is a representation of white Australia in both a loving way and a flawed way, like he has to spend a lot of the story going through an arc of relearning how he views white Australia and unlearning a lot of the assumptions he has about white Australia being superior or more civilized or even safer. It's really quite interesting the way that it's done and it's hopeful. I think it shows the way that reconciliation can be achieved on a very small, personal, and human scale. And it uses the familiar structures of romance narratives and coming-of-age narratives and romantic comedies to try and achieve that. And for what it's worth, the familial relationships through the dialogue are just very, very well done. You get a sense that regardless of how much conflict happens between these characters, they really, really do love each other. And that makes for a, a pleasant reading and viewing experience. Now, to what extent do I feel like this continues today? I don't know, just because I think around the time and maybe immediately after plays where this were being published, so the original production of Rainbow's End was in 2005. Hmm. Which is actually a little bit later than I thought it would be. Because this play is set in the 50s in the Menzies government and it follows the first visit of Queen Elizabeth to Australia, I thought it was written earlier, because around that time, and I remember this in high school and primary school as well, learning about Austra uh, Indigenous Australian history felt like this upward trajectory path where things were getting better, uh, 
the gap was being closed and there was active care across all of Australia to reinforce that narrative. In fact, in 2008, we had the formal apology to the uh, Stolen Generations. And it really did feel at that time like things were getting better. And then in the early, mid, late 2010s, there was a swing of conservatism, the history wars, just more and more conflict throughout this area to where we have it today, where it genuinely does feel like we've taken a few steps back. And this kind of comfortable lovey-dovey narrative of reconciliation just doesn't seem as appropriate anymore. I may be interpreting that wrong, but that's just how I feel about it. That being said, I still love the play, and I think that it would be a really gorgeous play performed today, or 20 years ago, or any of the times. So I would give it a 4 out of 5. Okay, it's sometime in March. I can't believe I forgot to record this, but Citizen, an American Lyric by Claudia Rankine is an amazing book. It is a collection of essays and anecdotes and poetry, and it's all kind of all arrayed together in this really interesting format. You never really know what you're going to get, but it's themed around the identity of the... of just the idea and experience of being African-American in America in the 21st century with questions of police violence and community kind of clashing together and being both very difficult to read but also very beautiful. I just felt like I understood some of the issues that Ranking was writing about a lot better just through the very multifaceted and varied ways that these are expressed. Um, it never feels difficult to read because you're always being presented with new information or new storytelling or new aesthetic aesthetics from a new angle that's just really, really powerful. It's an incredible experience. I love this idea of exploring things from multiple angles, including lots of different modes. It feels very modern and very fresh and very important. So I definitely give it a five out of five. Very glad I read it. In fact, I wish I had more than a day, but it was incredible. Definitely recommend. Da, 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 da. Okay, and that is 29 books read in 29 days. How crazy is that? I can't believe I did this again. Feeling a little bit worse this time because there's, I guess, less classics and less prominent works. I'm relying a lot more on poetry, on plays, on shorter collections, and I don't know if I enjoy that as much because I feel like I'm compromising the way that I read and not devoting enough time to mediums that I think really should have more time devoted to it. But now that that's done, I can go back to normal programming, normal reading, normal sleep schedules. I finally can have stop being told that I look so tired to everybody I see and meet. Uh, to make this happen, I squeeze in an extra hour or two hours of reading before bed, which means I'm going to bed at about 11.30 every single day, waking up at 5.30 to go to work, reading an hour on the train there, reading an hour on the train back. Uh, but it's done, and I'm happy, and I'm glad. So let's talk about our top three. Okay, this is a very easy decision to make, so I gave our three five stars across February, and thankfully it works across the three mediums that I focus on reading. So the first five stars that I gave out was for Fences by August Wilson. I think it holds up. I think this is a fantastic, genuinely amazing, affecting play. Just reading the dialogues and the script by itself, it got me teared up a little bit, so I can only imagine how much emotional damage it would cause watching it in performance. It is just so beautifully written, it is crisp and clear, the dialogue is just so powerful. Even some of the lines I'm remembering now, it's really, really getting to me. It's just a fantastic, fantastic work of literature, so I give this a 5 out of 5, like I said before, and I very highly recommend it if you are in the mood for some sadness and some very beautiful reflections on the African-American identity and just masculinity in a family setting in general. It's just a wonderful, wonderful play. Second one that got 5 out of 5, this one I guess represents poetry, but also sort of represents essays and nonfiction. is Citizen by Claudia Rankine. Wonderful, wonderful book as well. It feels like you're walking through an art gallery. It feels just so detailed and varied, the way that it represents a really difficult chapter of American history that's happening right now, the relationships between things like African-American communities and police violence is just so important to talk about but also so difficult to try and get a point across without being polemical or without being conciliatory towards certain groups in society and I feel like the way that Claudia Rankine has done it in Citizen is just 
very, very measured and careful and quite beautiful as well is that it really bombards you with the difficulties that are being faced by African Americans every day, but it also provides very thoughtful alternatives and different ways of looking at things and just the beauty of existence and community and resistance in the face of something that previously seemed impossible and the humanity that comes across in this book of all the people that are interviewed that are spoken to that are represented you can just feel how big the heart is and from there you get this enormous pathos to think about how people that are so real and so complex and so beautiful are faced with such harrowing struggles. It's just so well done. I never would have thought of any book like this working in this way, but I'm very glad to have read it and I would gladly recommend it to everybody. Number three, the third, five out of five is The Wizard of Earthsea. So I'm so excited to read the rest of these books having started the first one because it's just so well constructed. It's so well plotted. It's hard hitting in the ways that it exposes human vices within this family, within this fantasy setting, and it just works so well. You get everything that you want out of a fantasy work. You get the world building, you get the conflict between good and evil, but you also get really interesting questions that you can continue to ask yourself and think, how would I behave in this situation? How is this relevant to the kinds of lives and struggles that I have in my current day? And it's just, just. Excellent. It's just really excellent. It just makes you want to keep going and every digital page just has something new and something wonderful to display. It's just a fantastic, fantastic fantasy work. Um, five out of five. So those are my recommendations. I am not going to do a bottom three because I'm not really the kind of person to do negatives anymore. I feel like I'm not a roaster. I'm not a person who likes to point out flaws. I like to find books that I like and celebrate them and the ones that I don't like or the ones that don't really get to me I will just let them fade away. And so that's been my 29 of the month. Next month we'll return to normal programming with a reasonable amount of books, and I don't know how I'm going to get these back on my shelves, but let's see. Okay, goodbye.